Professor John Mearsheimer is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1982. Uh, let me do two things. First, let me talk about the origins uh, and the history of this crisis, and uh, then talk about why it's on the front burner today. Uh, and then let me say a few words in conclusion about where we're headed. Uh, the conventional wisdom in the West, and this is certainly true in a place like Britain and the United States, is that Putin is responsible for this crisis. It's the Russians. Uh, they're good guys and bad guys. And of course, we are the good guys and the Russians are the bad guys. This is simply wrong. Uh, the United States mainly, but the United States and its allies are responsible for this crisis, not Putin and Russia. Now, why do I say that? It's very important to understand that what the West has been trying to do since 2008 is turn Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And that policy had three dimensions to it. The first and most, most important is NATO expansion. The idea was that we were gonna expand NATO eastward to include Ukraine. The second element of the strategy was EU expansion. So in other words, it was not just NATO expansion that was gonna go and include Ukraine. It was also EU expansion. And the third element of the strategy was the color revolution. Uh, and in the case of Ukraine, that was the orange revolution. And the idea was to turn Ukraine into a liberal democracy like Britain, like the United States. And not only a liberal democracy, but a liberal democracy that was allied with the United States. Because again, this is all part and parcel of a strategy that is designed to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. Now, as I said to you, the most important element of the strategy is NATO expansion. And that's why the April 2008 Bucharest NATO summit is of immense importance. At the end of that April 2008 Bucharest summit, NATO announced that Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. They said, this is going to happen, period. The Russians made it unequivocally clear at that point that that is not going to happen. They drew a line in the sand. As you all know, there were two big tranches of NATO expansion before that 2008 meeting. The first tranche of NATO expansion was in 1999. That included Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. Then there was a second tranche in 2004, which included countries like Romania, uh, and the Baltic states, and so forth and so on. The Russians swallowed those two NATO expansions. They intensely disliked both of them, but they swallowed them. When NATO said in 2008 that expansion would now include Georgia and Ukraine, the Russians drew a line in the sand. It's very important to understand that. They said, this has not happened. It is no accident that in August of 2008, a few months after the April 2008 Bucharest summit, you had a war between Russia and Georgia. Remember, Georgia is the other country besides Ukraine that is gonna be brought into NATO. The Russians said, that ain't happening. And you had a war in August, 2008. In February, February 22nd to be exact, February 22nd, 2014, the crisis broke out over Ukraine. And it was mainly precipitated 
by a coup in Ukraine that overthrew a pro-Russian leader and installed a pro-American leader. The United States was involved in that coup. The Russians went ballistic. This is hardly surprising. They went ballistic and they did two things. First is they took Crimea from Ukraine. Why did they do that? You understand that there is a very important naval base called Sevastopol on Crimea. And there's no way the Russians are going to let Sevastopol become a NATO naval base. This is not going to happen. That's the principal reason that the Russians took Crimea. And the second thing that they did is that the Russians took advantage of a civil war that broke out in Eastern Ukraine almost immediately after the February 22nd, 2014 crisis. And what the Russians have done is they have fueled that civil war and they have made sure that their allies were mainly Russian speakers and in many cases Russian in Eastern Ukraine are not defeated by the Ukrainian government. They, in effect, are wrecking Ukraine. The Russians are basically saying, we will wreck Ukraine before we allow Ukraine to become a member of NATO. So the Russian response, it's very important to understand this, in 2014, when the crisis first broke out into the open in response to what had happened in Bucharest in 2008, the Russian response was twofold. Number one, they took Crimea. And you should all understand Crimea is gone. It is never going back to Ukraine, one. And number two, they have said implicitly that we will destroy Ukraine we will wreck it before we will let it become a member of NATO. Now, the question you want to ask yourself is, why are the Russians doing this? This is Realpolitik 101. And the fact that people in the West, especially in places like Britain and the United States, don't understand this boggles my mind. I just don't understand it. The idea that you could take a military alliance run by the United States, the most powerful state in the world, and run it up to Russia's borders, and the Russians wouldn't be bothered by it, is simply unthinkable. We in the United States have the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine says that no distant great power is allowed to form a military alliance with a country in the Western Hemisphere and is certainly not allowed to move military forces into the Western Hemisphere. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis very well. What happened there is the Soviets put nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. The United States said, this is categorically unacceptable. Military forces from afar are not allowed in the Western Hemisphere. And we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the end result is those missiles were removed. When the Soviets were later talking about building a naval base at Cienfuegos, the United States told them in no uncertain terms, you are not building a naval base at Cienfuegos. Just not gonna happen. The United States views the Western Hemisphere as its backyard, and it prohibits distant great powers from coming into its backyard. Well, don't you think the Russians are going to be deeply disturbed by the United States turning Ukraine into a bulwark right on its borders? Of course they are. And the Russians told us that immediately after the Bucharest summit. The Russians made it categorically clear, categorically clear, that Ukraine is not going to become part of NATO. But of course, the Americans and their allies did not listen because we believe that we're the good guys 
We're a benign hegemon here in the United States, and we can do pretty much anything we want in the world. And for a while, it looked like we could get away with that. As I said, the Russians accepted the first NATO expansion, the 1999 one, and they accepted the second NATO expansion. But after Bucharest, they said, this is not happening. So you had this major crisis that broke out in February 2014. Now, the crisis, the crisis tamped down quite a bit after 2014. But in the fall, in the fall of last year, 2021, it began to ramp up. And of course, early this year, and I'm talking about early 22, it became a full-blown crisis. First of all, going back to the Trump administration and continuing into the Biden administration, we are now arming Ukraine. We were not arming Ukraine during the Obama administration. In February 2014, when the crisis broke out and in the first few years after that crisis, when the Obama administration was in power, we refused to arm the Ukrainians because we knew it would enrage the Russians. It would scare the Russians. You want to understand that the Russians view Ukraine becoming a part of NATO as an existential threat. That's what's going on here. The Russians are sending a very clear message to the West. They're telling you, we take this threat seriously and we are willing to use military force if necessary to eliminate this threat. The Russians are not fooling around here. So what you had happening in 2021, and of course it started before that under the Trump administration, is we were arming the Ukrainians. And when you start talking about arming the Ukrainians, those are Ukrainian forces that can fight against Russia's allies in Eastern Ukraine. One thing that really spooked the Russians was that the Turks gave the Ukrainians drones. And drones have become a very effective weapon on the battlefield, as the Azerbaijanis proved against the Armenians last year. And the Azerbaijanis were using Turkish drones. So the Turks are giving drones, the Americans and the British are giving all sorts of other weapons to the Ukrainians. You know, of course, that we define these weapons as defensive weapons, but of course, as sophisticated IR theorists, you all know that there's no such thing as a meaningful distinction between defensive weapons and offensive weapons. As we all know from the security dilemma, what looks defensive to us looks offensive to them. You give drones to the Ukrainians. Do you think the Russians are going to view those as defensive weapons? I don't think so. Right? You start training the Ukrainian forces the way the British and the Americans do. You don't think the Russians are going to see that as a threat? I can guarantee you they are. Right. So what's happening here? We're arming, we're training the Ukrainians. And if you look at how we're dealing with Ukraine diplomatically, we're basically talking about Ukraine as if it were an ally or a partner. That's the kind of rhetoric we use when we talk about Ukraine. So it looks like diplomatically and militarily, the bonds between the West, especially the United States, and Ukraine are tightening. At the same time, we're doing a number of provocative things outside of Ukraine that really bother the Russians enormously. The British foolishly run a destroyer through Russian territorial waters in the Black Sea this past summer, June 2021. The Americans take a bomber and they drive it right up against the Russian coastline in the Black Sea. This really bothers the Russians, unsurprisingly. So that's where we are today. We have this major crisis, which goes back really to April 2008. That's, that, that's the genesis, that decision to make Ukraine part of NATO. And then you had the crisis break out, 22 February 2014. 
And over time, it, it was ameliorated somewhat, pushed to the back burner, I think one could say. And then all of a sudden, it broke out again. Now, is there any hope that we can settle this crisis? I'll tell you what I think the best solution is. I think it's an obvious solution, but I think it's politically unacceptable at this point in time. The obvious solution is to turn Ukraine into a neutral state, more or less a buffer between Russia on one side and NATO on the other. This is effectively what you had up until February 2014. Ukraine got its independence when the Soviet Union broke apart in December 1991. And from December 1991 until roughly early 2014, there was no real problem with Ukraine. The United States and its allies were not fighting with the Russians over Ukraine. There was a verbal dispute going back to the April 2008 Bucharest summit, but there was no crisis because Ukraine from 1991 to 2008, excuse me, to 2013 was, through 2013, was effectively a neutral state. It was a buffer. It was NATO that changed the situation. You understand, we now have changed the rhetoric to make the Russians the bad guys. You hear all this talk that Russia is bent on creating uh, the second coming of the Soviet Union. Uh, Russia is bent on creating a greater Russia. All right, the, the Russians are the bad guys. This is a story that was invented after February 22nd, 2014. Nobody was making this argument before February 22nd, 2014. Nobody was arguing that we had to expand NATO to contain Russia before February 22nd, 2014. What happened on February 22nd, 2014 is this cockamamie strategy that we had invented to make Romania, uh, to make Ukraine a part of NATO blew up in our face. And when it blew up in our face because of our flawed policies, we were not going to admit that we had screwed up. No, we had to blame the Russians. So we said they were bent all along on dominating Eastern Europe. And of course, you hear the same argument made today. It's the Russians who are the bad guys. Putin is really dangerous. We can't negotiate with him. This is the equivalent of Munich, which is another way of saying he's the second coming of Adolf Hitler and making a deal on Ukraine is like making a deal on Czechoslovakia in October, 1938. This is all pure unadulterated nonsense, right? Again, there was no threat from Russia between before February 22nd, 2014. Just wasn't. We invented that story. Um, I'm curious to what extent the logic of Ukraine being a neutral zone or buffer state uh, can be applied to Southeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis China and whether or not the same um, the breathing space can be established there. One can argue that it's hard to have buffer states between great powers because each great power has a vested interest in turning that buffer state into an ally or even conquering it. This is why a country like Poland, which used to be sandwiched between Germany or Prussia and Russia or the Soviet Union and Austria disappeared from the map on numerous occasions. Poland had terrible geography because it was sandwiched in between these great powers. But if you think about Ukraine today, Naman, there's no great power on the left-hand side of Ukraine. There is a great power, Russia, on one side. But if you take away the United States and NATO expansion, there's no threat to Ukraine. There's no great power threatening Ukraine on its left-hand side. And Russia, as I said, 
has no interest in conquering Ukraine and doesn't have to worry much about Ukraine for strategic reasons in the absence of NATO expansion. So you take NATO expansion away, Ukraine can easily remain a buffer state. If you go to East Asia, the question is what countries look like buffer states? And I don't see any buffer states out there. And the reason is that the potential points of conflict in East Asia involve the South China Sea, Taiwan, and the East China Sea, especially these rocks in the East China Sea that the Japanese say belong to them and the Chinese say belong to them. Instead of having buffer states with regard to those three flashpoints, you have water. You have the South China Sea, no buffer state, it's all about water. You have Taiwan, the buffer between Taiwan and mainland China is water. And then you have these rocks in the East China Sea where the buffer between them and Japan and them and China is water. Okay, but you could argue that if you look at Taiwan, you look at these islands or islets in the South China Sea, and you look at the rocks in the East China Sea, that both sides, both the Chinese side and the American-led side, have a vested interest in controlling those pieces of territory in the same way that the great powers had a vested interest in controlling Poland in the past. In other words, think about Taiwan. The United States and Japan, and now Australia, they want to keep Taiwan on our side of the ledger. The Chinese want Taiwan back, not only because it's sacred territory to them, but also because it has important strategic value. So you can see, in response to your question, that if you look at East Asia and you look at how the Americans, the Japanese and the Australians on one hand think about Taiwan, and you look at how the Chinese think about Taiwan, it's important strategic real estate that they both have their eye on for good security related reasons. And that's not unlike Poland in the past. And <coughs> excuse me, it's not unlike Ukraine in a world where a NATO alliance moves to incorporate Ukraine into, uh, into NATO. But the general point here is that great powers worry greatly about their security. They tend to be paranoid. And any smaller country that lives in the neighborhood of a great power should be extremely careful not to anger any of its great power neighbors because those great power neighbors are likely then to do terrible things to them. Hiya, um, so you mentioned that the crisis was kind of in the, in the background for quite a long time, um, but the reason it basically bubbled, bubbled back up is because um, uh, the US and UK and so on started sending arms to, to the Ukraine. What actually caused this change of policy uh, uh, from kind of the Western side that to send these arms to the Ukraine all of a sudden? The first point to make is it, it's important to understand that it started under Trump, right? A and you want to remember that if Donald Trump had gotten his way, we wouldn't have this crisis today. Donald Trump wanted to do away with NATO, so there'd be no NATO. Donald Trump wanted to jump into bed with Vladimir Putin, he liked Vladimir Putin. So the relations between the United States and the Russians would be much better today. And Donald Trump also wanted to pivot to Asia. Donald Trump was the first president to recognize that China was uh, a peer competitor. Uh, but anyway, he didn't get his way with Russia. And in fact, what he did, this is Trump, what he did with Russia is he started arming the Ukrainians to the chagrin of the Russians. So your question, which is an excellent one, is why do we do this? Uh, I think there are two reasons. 
First of all, the Russophobia in the West is, especially the United States, is just off the charts. It's truly remarkable how much Russophobia there is in the United States. Uh, I've got a question from Ben here, which is, presuming that one does believe in the liberal international order and viewing it as a concept arising and viewing it as a concept arising in its current form after the collapse of the Soviet Union, do you think it's fair to say that we've moved out of this liberal order if we're talking about a return to Cold War spheres of influence and buffer states? Yeah, I've actually written a piece on this that's on my website. It's called Bound to Fail uh, that deals with the uh, liberal international order and what I think happened. Uh, and for anybody who's seriously interested in what I have to say, you should take a look at Bound to Fail. Uh, my basic argument on this uh, is that the liberal international order was only possible in a unipolar world. Uh, that with the rise of China and the resurrection of Russian power, you move from unipolarity to multipolarity. And in that multipolar world, it's impossible to sustain a liberal international order. And let me tell you why. It's very important to understand that an international order is comprised of institutions. That's what an order is. An order is a cluster of institutions, many institutions. And those institutions are really rules that allow states to engage in economic and diplomatic intercourse, okay? That's what the institutions do. Uh, the World Trade Organization, and before that, GATT. GATT was the predecessor of the WTO. Those institutions were designed to facilitate international trade. Now, it's important to understand, it's the great powers who write the rules. The great powers form institutions, they build institutions, they basically run institutions. This gets back to my earlier point that the United States basically runs NATO. It's the most powerful state on the planet, certainly the most powerful state in the West during the Cold War, and was the most powerful state in the world during the unipolar moment. So, what happened was that you had this liberal international order during the unipolar moment, roughly from 1990 to 2017. And the United States created it and loved it. And we wrote the rules. But what's happened here is that we've moved out of unipolarity and the Chinese are now very powerful. They're a peer competitor. And the Chinese want to rewrite the rules. And the Chinese, by the way, want to create new international institutions of their own, like the AIIB. I don't blame the Chinese at all. But the Chinese are now challenging the Americans, as are the Russians, but mainly the Chinese are challenging the Americans regarding the shape of the existing international order. And the Chinese are creating new institutions. The Americans are creating new institutions because we're in a new Cold War. So that liberal international order that existed during the unipolar moment has fallen apart. And we're never going to see it again. Yeah, thank you so much. I actually wanted to make a brief comment about uh, the Russia Fovia and then the question. Um, I was part of the Youth Atlantic Association before, and I remember we had a workshop at NATO headquarters in Brussels, and we were all young, young students, and we were all surprised that throughout the whole day, we could, we could have talked about cybersecurity, inter interoperability, and they all talked about Russia, and we were pretty taken aback about how sort of obsessed, obsessed they were. Um, so just to say, as maybe with the younger generation, it, it actually may, may change. It also felt like they were basing, like sort of like they were trying to justify their existence, like NATO was trying to justify their existence with Russia. <laughs> uh, but we'll see.
Anyways, my, my question is, um, do you think that with the, with the current Ukraine situation, uh, one of the things that NATO, of course, discusses most frequently is how governments should spend up to 2% of their uh, GDP in, in defense, in their defense. Um, do you think that this situation is going to, of course, it's going to matter from the international relations perspective for these governments, um, but do you think there's actually going to be a change in their defense systems? I could imagine it maybe from Poland, uh, but do you think it's likely or maybe not um, that the um, NATO members will increase their uh, defense budget? Yeah, let me, let me comment first on your remarks about your experience on the Russophobia front. Yeah. I think your instincts are exactly right here. NATO needs the Russian threat to exist. Remember what John said. John said, when I was talking to Tom, John said that the United States should pivot to Asia. You want to remember, anytime you pivot to some place, you pivot from, away from another place. Yeah. My view is, and many people in the United States believe that we should pivot away from Europe and pivot to Asia, because that's where the peer competitor is. Well, if you have a deep-seated interest in maintaining NATO and maintaining the American military presence in Europe, then hyping the Russian threat is mana from heaven. Mm. So it's no accident that Stoltenberg, who is the head of NATO, goes on and on day after day about how dangerous the Russian threat is, how NATO has to stand up to the Russian threat, how important NATO expansion is for maintaining the alliance and keeping peace in Europe and so forth and so on. Uh, by the way, if you look at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., go to their website, the Atlantic Council. The Atlantic Council you know, worries greatly about the so-called transatlantic relationship. The Atlantic Council wants make, to make sure that the transatlantic relationship remains firmly intact, mm -hmm. that NATO remains firmly intact, that the Americans remain firmly committed to the defense of Europe. And if you look at the Atlantic Council and what they have to say about the Russian threat and the present crisis, uh, it will be music to your ears. You'll see exactly what's going on here, right? So, uh, so I find none of this surprising. Uh, with regard to whether or not the European members of NATO are now going to spend 2% of GNP uh, on defense or even more, uh, I would say don't hold your breath uh, <laughs> waiting for that to happen. Look, the Europeans are basically free riders. And from the European point of view, it's the smart thing to do. If you're Germany, why spend 2% of GNP on defense if the United States is going to take care of you anyway? Right? So your, most European countries have figured out that it makes sense to let the Americans do the heavy lifting and to free ride. Now, if the United States leaves Europe, we pivot to Asia and the Europeans are on their own and they decide that the Russians are a serious threat, then the Russians will spend 2% of GNP on dealing with the Russian threat. Uh, the Germans certainly will. All you have to do is look at the geography of Europe. Britain is separated from the continent by a huge body of water. Russia is far away from Britain. Germany is very close to mm -hmm. Russia. And if the Germans don't have the Americans protecting them and the Germans have to provide for their own defense, they'll probably spend 2% of GNP on defense. And by the way, a really good indicator of how this works is just looking at the Japanese over time. During most of the Cold War, and certainly during the unipolar moment, the Japanese did not spend a lot of money on defense and they deferred to the United States and they were free riders. And I'm not criticizing them because from their point of view, it made sense to be a free rider, right? But now that China is emerging as a serious threat 
to Japan, especially in the East China Sea, and especially with regard to Taiwan, the Japanese are increasing their defense spending and they're beginning to do more and more for their own defense than they did in the past. They're beginning to talk more and more like realists. The Japanese sound more and more like me than they ever did in the past. And this is because they're now facing what they think is an existential threat in China. Uh, but absence that in Europe, and given the presence of the United States, uh, I think you can rest assured that the Europeans, most European countries are going to continue to spend less than 2% of GNP on defense. 